My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlanta Council. Uh, I'd like to introduce today one of our great new senior uh, fellows at the Atlantic Council, Terrell Germain Starr, who is a senior correspondent for The Root, where he writes perceptively about American politics, but also a great expert on Eurasia, who's lived over four years in Georgia, Ukraine, and elsewhere. And Terrell will be moderating our event today on Crimean Tatars, and he has an all-star lineup for you. He has Ayla Bakali, who's the U.S. representative and executive member of the World Congress of Crimean Tatars and the Tatar representative at the U.N. We have Emin Japarova, who's a first deputy foreign minister of Ukraine. And we have Rustem Umerov, who's a member of the Verkhovna Rad in Kiev. And they will talk to you about what's going on in Crimea. Terrell, over to you. I regret I'm not with you in person today, but I will be in the future. Thank you all. Oh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to our event. This is going to be a, a really informative uh, conversation about the state of Crimea Tartars um, and Crimea, which is under occupation uh, by the Kremlin. And so let's uh, get started off to the uh, first deputy prime, first deputy foreign minister. Um, obviously, the priority is to uh, return Crimea back to Ukraine, but I'm particularly interested in uh, what communication uh, for people who don't know, um, what, what kind of communication is taking place between Ukraine um, and Russia as it relates to Crimea, particularly the persecution of, of Tartars? And can you talk about the type of legal support that they're getting in Russia, given that Kiev doesn't have a lot of direct uh, on the ground power uh, there as it stands now? Yeah, um, happy to welcome everyone at the discussion. I also happy to see Ayla Hanum and Rustem Bey, those whom I know perfectly well and those who are striving for the Crimean Tatars uh, at a certain point. Speaking about uh, the communication, well, officially, Ukraine does not recognize the occupation of Crimea and there is no any kind of official contact between Kyiv and uh, the occupation authorities in Crimea. Uh, this is a technical side of the coin. Uh, as for those hostages and the citizens of Ukraine, who are the whole population of uh, Crimea, 2.5 million of Ukrainian citizens, we do recognize uh, those people as the citizens of Ukraine and thus uh, having our effort to support those people who are living under the conditions of the occupation and repressions. Unfortunately, we have to state that the main repression kind of target are the Crimean Tatars as indigenous people as far as there is a historical background. Let me remind you a little bit to those who are listening and watching us that the first annexation happened in 1783 in 18th century when the Russian Empire annexed Crimea and actually the same uh, core policy started to be committed a couple of centuries ago when the Russian uh, Tsarist regime started to oppress indigenous Crimean Tatar people, those who were not ready to bow and to recognize new rulers of Crimea. And within 100 uh, years after the first annexation, one third of population immigrated to mostly Ottoman Empire at that time. The second pillar of our history that actually describes why Crimean Tatars stand and took the stand of non-recognizing the occupation is the deportation of 1944 when the Stalin regime, the, communi the communists exiled Crimean Tatars under the pretext of the so-called cooperation with the Nazi Germany. But actually, if you see the statistics, women, seniors and children were put in the cattle shed wagons and exiled to mostly Uzbekistan to the Middle uh, Asian countries. And then again, this uh, current challenge that we face as a country and the whole international community is the occupation of 2014. And let's let us not have an illusion that Crimea is a military base. So of course, humanitarian dimension is not being considered by neither Russia nor uh, occupation authority. This is exactly why we don't have any kind of communications with those representatives of uh, occupation regime. But we are trying to have the legal assistance to those who are oppressed by the uh, Russian uh, occupation authorities. We have approximately a bit more than 100 citizens of Ukraine in the jails, both in Crimea and the other territory and the territories of Russia. 
uh, as the occupying country. And we also try to um, kind of raise the awareness of international community on what is going on with those Ukrainians, because why is it important if you ask me? Because publicity is the only instrument that saves and protects people. Because otherwise, if we didn't have the solid position and stand of international community, we would have not 130 political prisoners, but thousands of those imprisoned for the position. Uh, if you dare moderate, dare to say that Crimea is Ukraine and you would live in, in Crimea, you would be put in the prison for at least five years. So this is the reality, the reality of fear. And for us as the country, it is crucial to consolidate the international effort and to provide assistance and to keep this very connection between the mainland of Ukraine and, and, and Crimea via the documents. We do not recognize the Russian uh, passports because it was a forcible passportization and, and all those living in Crimea, they remain having Ukrainian documents. So for us, this is the most crucial. First deputy, before I move on to our other panelists, I want to ask you, how has the international outreach to countries, namely America, uh, been going as it pertains to this issue? The United States is the strategic partner of Ukraine and actually one of the uh, biggest friends in terms of support of our territorial integrity. Uh, we are very thankful to the American people for that solid position that we have. And on behalf of my government, let me express it once again. Second, uh, in terms of the international outreach, we are now actually uh, initiating the launch of the Crimean platform, which is a new format that actually should go beyond the so-called comfort zone that we all as the international community living for six years. So let us kind of see that the occupation happened in 2014. And since that, we have certain efforts, but we need better coordination. And for that reason, we are initiating the launch of this international platform that will be an ecosystem of events and that will actually focus on several dimensions. The highest political level is the level of the leaders of states and governments. And we want to launch the Crimean summit in 2021 in Kyiv. We are now working on the date and on the modality of the summit as far as coronavirus actually brings additional obstacles because we wanted to have a physical format in Kyiv. But unfortunately, we have to state that this is probably the only obstacle for us to come up with a clear date. We are now drafting the declaration. We have a Pompeo declaration for Crimea, which we're also thankful for. But we, as the country concerned and as the country interested, uh, probably should um, actually initiate additional instruments. So all those countries willing to support Ukraine will join the Crimean platform and attend Kyiv and adhere to the uh, declaration that actually focuses on the very basic things like non-recognition policy, like sanction policy, like mm -hmm. um, diplomatic and political frame of our fight for Crimea, which is about pressure, which is about international pressure, economic pressure, legal pressure, political pressure. So this is actually what we want to galvanize as a country. And then there are several other layers, but probably uh, this is a matter of a separate discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for First Deputy uh, Foreign Minister. So. For those of you who are listening, if you have questions, please go to the Q&A section. Uh, it should be at the bottom of your screen and uh, post a question and we will figure out a way to get that question uh, addressed. So let's move on to Ms. Uh, Bakala, uh, U.S. Representative, uh, Executive Member of the World Congress of Crimean Tartars. So as a representative of the U.N., uh, tell me what is the most pressing issue you're bringing to the body about Crimea, particularly how have your American colleagues uh, responded? Yeah, thank you, Terrell, so much. And um, truly, um, you are really joining us in uh, supporting uh, in supporting in creating a platform for the Crimean Tatar uh, Tatars uh, worldwide. Um, Atlantic Council has. Uh, thousands of members, so uh, we are very excited about that. Um, the uh, Crimean Tatars have self-identified as uh, indigenous people of the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine, and they have been active 
uh, at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues through uh, since the uh, creation and development of this permanent forum. Um, this permanent forum is critical as it is the most highly attended uh, forums at the United Nations. It is comprised of uh, nation states where indigenous people sit um, in side by side uh, with respect to uh, the way the seating is on, on the columns, by columns. And they have a, a, an opportunity to voice what is really happening on the ground uh, in uh, Crimea. So um, we have a, a very uh, active uh, Crimean Tatar uh, NGOs, uh, Crimean Tatar representatives, and uh, they uh, bring the uh, voices and the issues uh, on, from the ground, from the grassroots level in occupied Crimea directly to an international platform. And uh, in addition to that, we have the World Congress of Crimean Tatars, which is a uh, Ukrainian Crimean Tatar NGO. And it is comprised of members throughout uh, the uh, diaspora. And it is uh, a product as a result of uh, Crimean Tatars being exiled throughout Central Asia, Siberia, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Romania, uh, uh, Turkey, and the United States. So uh, it is a um, uh, another conduit to communicate um, the issues uh, from the ground roots on uh, multiple tiers of platforms uh, to make the case known that Russia um, what is the occupier of the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine, and that the staunch advocacy of the Crimean Tatars, both in occupied Crimea and elsewhere, soured the image of Crimea that it was annexed happily and peacefully. So uh, this is very, very important. And we have a precedence, the Crimean Tatars, that uh, as the most mobilized group of people to um, uh, voice our um, indigenous issues uh, on this platform. I wanted to follow up by asking, when you're speaking to an international audience that's not keen on Tatars in Ukraine and, they, and people not realizing that this uh this indigenous group exists how do you do you, how do you explain even um the tatar community within ukraine and also do you get into conversations about race and ethnicity as it pertains to tatars in ukraine and elsewhere because i could assume that many americans would be confused that there's this distinct group that exists carol that's an excellent question and it really triggered a um, lot of, of, of some of the talking points that I wanted to have an opportunity to voice. And what I want to really communicate to your audience, Terrell, that the 1944 end mass deportation of the Crimean Tatars were inflicted by Soviet Russia and that it is not Ukraine. Uh, that's number one. And in addition to that, it's very important that um, just to give you a, uh, a little bit background, as you mentioned, um, how do we communicate how we came to be uh, in this situation? Uh, you know, um, the occupation for the Crimean Tatars has been a nightmare and who have never accepted this illegal annexation. The Crimean Tatars currently, Terrell, are living in a time zone in which their past has become their present. And what I mean by that is that the Crimean Tatar child, who was born during Ukraine's independence after the fall of Soviet Union, that is between 1991 through 2014, is experiencing the similar history of persecution 
as did his grandparent, who was also born in Crimea, but prior to the 1944 deportation. So here we have before us a both uh, a grandfather and a grandchild facing the same historical nemesis. And, and it, to wit, to wit, this, uh, this post-deportation proceeded with the Sovietization of the Crimean Peninsula, imposing uh, Russian nomenclature into the society and the replacement of the deported indigenous Crimean Tatars with ethnic Russians that number 58% of Crimea's population today. So, um, and today, the 2014, under the Russian Federation, the Crimean Tatars are gradually uh, uh, being assimilated with the uh, Russian culture. And uh, so uh, you can understand, um, I hope, that having returned to the homeland after the fall of Soviet Union, uh, during uh, the ensuing of Ukraine's independence, the Crimean Tatars sacrificed a lot. They began to uh, rebuild their lives um, once again, and they were so happy to return to their homeland, and which uh, was abruptly interrupted in 2014. So uh, the political prisoners that uh, we read at the news, um, um, in um, occupied Crimea, uh, you can understand why it is inconceivable for them to send, surrender and leave their homeland. So um, in this endeavor of return, Ukraine has been quite uh, supportive. Uh, Ukraine and the Crimean Tatars Terrell have the same nemesis. Ukraine has the 1932-33 Holodomor, the Crimean Tatars have the 1944 deportation. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to also communicate that the uh, Ukrainian people uh, empathize with the Crimean Tatars. And mm -hmm. the Ukrainian government also understands that the most important currency for the Crimean Tatars are dignity and honor. And in that respect, do provide tremendous platforms. You asked about your previous question about um, you know, how Ukraine is working with the United States. And I just wanted to tie, expand on Emina Hanum's um, excellent response, mm. which is that what happens in Kiev triggers down to what happens <laughs> in uh, here in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. There is a very strong, powerful, highly educated Ukrainian advocacy uh, groups, all nonprofit organizations, um, civic-minded Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars go um, twice, uh, three times a year uh, mm -hmm. on these advocacy sessions. And we have been quite instrumental on the uh, implementation of anti-annexation bill. So I just wanted to uh, have a shout out um, to that community and their support of the Crimean Tatars. Thank you very much. And for those who are listening, please send in your questions. Please keep in mind to keep the questions succinct. I'm looking at some of them now. There are, some of them are a bit long and I can't read them all. So if you're succinct, uh, it stands a likely chance that I'll be able to ask your question. So uh, moving on to Mr. Umarov, um, kind of going back on what uh, Mrs. Uh, Bakala uh, was talking about, I want to ask you about the type, uh, about the uh, displaced uh, uh, Crimean Tatars who are in, you know, who are outside of the uh, occupied uh, territories and what types of resources and, and, and challenges are they facing as a result of the uh, Kremlin occupation. Of course, we have, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Also, thank you for having Ms. Jafarova and Ms. Bakalle uh, on the session. Uh, on the IDPs issue, we have uh, currently up to 60,000 people that left uh, Crimea uh, uh, towards Ukraine. 
uh, mainland and half of them are uh, Crimean Tatars. Uh, at this stage, we're experiencing a seven year occupation. Unfortunately, uh, many issues are rising. We were not ready for it, but nevertheless, uh, as has been mentioned by my colleagues, uh, first of all, we are trying to make the advocacy on international arena and inside of Ukraine for the IDPs. Uh, we initiated several programs uh, for the IDPs, namely uh, the housing project that we are actively, actively now seeking the support. And thanks to Turkish Republic uh, for this support. It's a thousand uh, apartment construction for the IDPs. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are issues with the budgeting in Ukraine, but I hope within the several years we might have our own uh, project to support IDPs uh, within our realms inside of Ukraine. Uh, we're trying to open up the cultural and educational centers for the IDPs. Uh, uh, especially for the Crimean Tatars, so that they can uh, preserve their cultural uh, and religious identity. Uh, in the cities that our Crimean Tatars are living now, namely in Kiev, Lviv, uh, Odessa, Dnipro, Kharkiv, Kherson. So those are the um, maybe humanitarian issues. Uh, apart from this, or uh, in addition to this, there are many NGOs that has been uh, opened up that are focusing the human rights to the religious uh, uh, rights uh, inside of mainland. And uh, they serve the IDPs as well as they serve the people that left uh, inside Crimea. So this is short literal. Okay, thank you. So I have uh, a question from a... Uh, Dimitro from the National News Agency of Ukraine, and perhaps you, um, Mr. Umarov, or um, or the uh, First Deputy Foreign Minister could address this best. And the question is, um, Russian authorities oppress and brought the uh, Crimean Tatar, uh, uh, Tatars in jail, considering them as Russian citizens. It's clear Ukraine does not recognize Russian occupation of Crimea, but it does not changed the Russian approach to the matter. And so what efforts can be done from the Ukrainian side to free, um, he has his number of 140 prisoners to his account. Um, so what, what can be done from the Ukrainian side to free the current, according to this uh, reporter's estimate, 140 um, prisoners and what kind of legislation should be applied in this case? Um, if you, will uh... Ms. Jafarova uh, or myself, I would just shortly say that we're working on the legal side of this uh, and we are going to propose uh, the legislation on political prisoners soon. Uh, it is in the cabinet of ministers now and the cabinet should uh, analyze it. So uh, after this, we'll propose it to, to the parliament. So it's in between actually legislators and cabinet of ministers who uh, uh, who is going to propose it. So in a second, if this law passes, we'll have more legal grounds to support it financially. Uh, in addition to your question on release of our political prisoners, there are efforts by our uh, Ukrainian state, and namely uh, many things are done by uh, Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs, <laughs> the uh, Office of the President. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, any of the releases of Crimean Tatars yet. And mm -hmm. with the support of our international partners, namely Turkey at this stage and uh, US to support us uh, for the release uh, of these political prisoners. Yeah, so um, so uh, first deputy foreign minister, I, I really, if you don't mind uh, for our listeners, who may not know the current situation of the political prisoners in Crimea, um, particularly particularly those who are targeted uh, based on religion um, and, and their ethnicity. Do you mind giving us um, a brief um, kind of explanation of that situation, please? And let me just brief you a little bit on what Crimea is today. So uh, sure. for Ukraine, it's 7% of our territory is under occupation, both Crimea and Donbass. 
1.5 million of IDPs, including those who left and abandoned Crimea. As my colleague Rustem Omerov already has mentioned uh, that we are talking about approximately 60,000, but uh, let me also be crystal clear that there is no clear official statistic as far as many Ukrainians uh, do not get the registration as the IDP thinking that it is a discriminatory one. So we believe that these numbers de facto are even higher. Uh, so we also think that uh, the, the numbers that we are talking about, uh, re referring to the occupation, are the 14,000 of Ukrainians died uh, in the war in Donbass and 40,000 of Ukrainians wounded. So these are the tragic numbers that we have to face uh, in terms of the seventh year of occupation and the war in Donbass. As for Crimea, as I told you before, it's a military base and every single act of Russia, even in terms of infrastructure buildup, has a very clear military cause. Even the roads that are built up in Crimea are for the matter to, to, to enforce their military presence. So uh, Russia has doubled its uh, army presence. They are modernizing their uh, military components, but like in air, sea and land. They have six submarines in the Black Sea, which is more than enough to control the whole equatorium in the Black Sea. And the humanitarian dimension is nothing but uh, a theater of absurd. When people are put in the prison just for the video clip they used to produce in 2013 about Islam, let's say. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. we had the situation with the Ukrainians, uh, one of those, Vladimir Baluch, he is already in Kyiv, who dared to put the fr Ukrainian flag on the rooftop uh, of his house. And several times FSB came to him and warned that he would have problems in case if he didn't take the flag off the rooftop. And he refused. And finally, he uh, had these problems because the FSB found the explosive and weaponry in his house. So he was put in the prison for this, for the matter. We, uh, Adem Bikirov, a Crimean Tatar, he was, he's an invalid. He was traveling from Kherson to the Crimean Peninsula. He was uh, put in the prison uh, as the one who uh, was uh, transferring the explosive, uh, 14 kilograms of explosion. But in fact, he is an invalid and he hardly can uh, actually raise 14 kilograms weight. So uh, we have these cases and like Ahtem Chigos or Rifat Chubarov or Mustafa Jamilev, they are all uh, under the criminal, let's say, uh, investigation persecution. Ahtem Chigos was put in the prison for the actions that were uh, for the so-called uh, mass rallies that brought and led to the death of several people in Crimea. But actually, this was the rally that uh, um, under the building of the uh, Crimean parliament, when under the call of Mejlis, uh, Crimean Tatars rushed the uh, parliament building and did not allow uh, the members of parliament, Crimean parliament, to vote for those red carpet decisions that would legitimize Russia's presence. And uh, uh, it happened uh, in February 26, in 2014, and Russia actually actually commits and, and uh, executes the Russian legislation to those Ukrainian citizens uh, for the period that was not about, as they claim, the Russian time being. So we believe that this is a process of a political persecution. Another important issue is that this uh, house searches taking place almost every day. It's an um, um, instrument that uh, brings people or involves people into this huge level of fear you can even sense it with skin because people traveling to the mainland of ukraine what i noticed from my personal experience when they discuss things about uh, crimea or ukraine or russia they start to whisper so it's a huge level of censorship of self-censorship because of this fear because when you see that something happens to your neighbor or whoever can be put in the prison just for the post in the facebook or the flag or whatever reason behind. So it's about uh, not uh, having this uh, freedom and, and ability to exercise freedom of expression and so on. Uh, another important uh, things that I want to share with you is that active colonization is taking place. Uh, mm -hmm. I really think that we have to be very um, attentive to this process as far that Changing the demography for Russia is also a very classical instrument to shape the loyal population to bleach out its own crimes. Uh, occupation 
of Crimea is, an in, is a violation of international uh, law and humanitarian law. By occupying Crimea, R Russia violated uh, hundreds of bilateral and multilateral agreements with Ukraine. And uh, uh, as the first step by this repressive reality I was talking about, they are squeezing out citizens of Ukraine from, from, from Crimea. And from another hand, they are bringing the Russian citizens to Crimea. So mm -hmm. under different, uh, we have different numbers. Again, official statistics of Russian Federation says that approximately 100 something thousand of Russians moved to Crimea, but non-officially five times more, uh, higher, mm -hmm. I mean, the number. So we believe that approximately half a million of Russian citizens are already in Crimea. And of course, this is a huge threat for, for also national security. Thank you very much, uh, First Deputy Foreign Minister. Um, I perhaps, and I want to move on to Mr. Uh, Umarov, but before that, for our listeners, thank you very much for staying on. If you have questions, please uh, drop the question and, and the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Make sure your question is succinct to the point so I can ensure that it will be addressed. Uh, Mr. Umarov, there is a, a major water crisis in Crimea. In fact, I was in uh, I, I was I was in Skodovsk, and I was near the canal or or the the areas where water goes into Crimea. And a few friends of mine were showing me around, and we're just talking about the major crisis that's going on in Crimea. And I want to ask you how much is this water crisis impacting uh, the efforts to uh, not only um, to return Crimea back into Ukraine, but also is there a disinformation battle going on in which uh, the occupying forces are blaming Ukraine for this water crisis? Sure. Uh, Russia, Russia's new strategy is to blame Ukraine on everything, especially in water crisis. Uh, but as we know that uh, they occupied the territory. In addition, they lay the gas pipes, uh, oil pipes through all the territory and bring it to Europe. So uh, it's not a, a very unusual for them to actually bring water to the occupied territory, but uh, they are not doing it. They are not putting the pipes. Uh, it's a violation, first of all, but nevertheless, I think they're not doing it in one purpose, just to blame Ukraine, saying that uh, Ukraine causes uh, the humanitarian crisis. It's their new, uh, let's say, fake news story. So <laughs> at this stage, uh, technically, one billion cubic meters uh, is produced within uh, Crimea out of which 200, 300 million cubic meters are used for the population. The remaining part is actually used for the military bases and uh, for those people whom they brought from Russia. So, which means that there is a mass movement of Russian citizens to Crimea. Uh, and that is why they use this water for their uh, for their purposes. That is why, as Ukraine, we say that our citizens have enough water there, but it's not enough for the military bases. Mm -hmm. And this story is a fake news story created by Russian Federation uh, to make uh, Ukraine weak in the in the eyes of the uh, Western partners. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I have a question for the first deputy foreign minister before she has to go off. Uh, she has to leave us and then I'll go on to um, Isla. But uh, a question from one of our participants, Robert uh, Friedman. He asks, what do you think a Biden administration versus say a, a Trump administration will do to advance the causes of Crimea? Uh, Tatars. Did I get the question correctly? That the question was about what is our effort to to support Crimean Tatars? 
No, the question is, what do you think a Biden administration, if uh, Biden wins, uh, will, will do uh, in, in support of returning uh, Crimea to Ukraine and Crimea to Tatars in general? Do you think basically a switch in a, a U.S. administration um, would make any differences in your efforts? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. I don't think that there would be a drastical change in terms of the attitude of U.S. Uh, towards the issue of Crimean uh, um, attempted annexation. We uh, state that um, the support that we have from U.S., both in terms of the military support that we have for our army, is actually something that's really important in terms of prevention of uh, appetite and aggressive policy of Russia for Ukraine, but also other uh, statements that the state DEP uh, regularly comes up with. Uh, an initiative supported by U.S. officially will be there despite of the change in the White House. Uh, I think that uh, many American politicians declared uh, both Democrats and Republicans uh, are quite vocal in terms of their support for Crimea and Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians and Ukraine itself as a country. So we don't expect that there would be any kind of shift or change uh, um, as the result of the elections um, of the president in US. And we actually are, we, we think that uh, as far as we don't synchronize our efforts mm -hmm. with the uh, results of the elections. And for mm -hmm. us, the most important is that it is the choice of American people. And mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the institutions, American institutions are that strong to actually have the issue supported uh, on the political agenda, despite of those who will be who will enter the White House. Thank you very much, uh, First Deputy uh, Foreign Minister. And I want to take this question from Zanon, and I hope I'm pronouncing this person's name correctly. I want to ask uh, Mrs. Bakala this question, and the question is: of all the ethnicities within Russia, um, why does the Kremlin appear to view Tatars as a unique threat? I believe he's, I mean, yeah. Yes, thank you, um, thank you. Well, um, I uh, alluded, uh, my responses alluded, alluded a little bit to, uh, um, to that question, and that is um, that the indigenous Crimean Tatars, in particular, are uh, the indigenous people of Crimea. It is their historic homeland, and there have been efforts, multiple efforts, since uh, the Russian Tsar era uh, to use Crimea as a springboard to have access to the Mediterranean and uh, to their imperialistic policies. And it was succeeded by the 1944 deportation and in which the Crimean Tatars have never accepted uh, uh, that uh, uh, they have uh, in any way lost their homeland, their identity, uh, their traditions, their language are all uh, linked uh, to the Crimean Peninsula. So Russia uh, sees Crimean Tatars as a major threat because the Crimean Tatars are the most mobilized group in voicing successively throughout history against the uh, deportation, occupation, and re-annexation. So the image that um, uh, Russian Federation has uh, put out there that all is quiet in Crimea and that everybody is happy. In the meantime, the Crimean Tatars are persecuted. Uh, they uh, are not allowed, to, uh, their houses are boarded up, their windows are boarded up, their children are escorted by adults to school for fear of abuse, and um, the Crimean Tatars cannot commun 
commemorate uh, their traditional holidays, um, Crimean Tatar Flag Day. And uh, so it is the uh, most um, active and uh, vocal group uh, that has never accepted uh, Russia and it continues not to. And there is um, one group I think we uh, really should mention uh, that has been very active is the, uh, on the ground today is the Crimean Solidarity Group. Mm -hmm. And this Crimean Solidarity Group plays a very important role in occupied Crimea today because uh, they came uh, to being organically as a group, they came to force as a uh, organically and uh, uh, among the civic minded individuals who happen to be of the Muslim faith. And they are also Ukrainians within the Crimean Solidarity Group who um, mobilize uh, to defend uh, those Crimean Tatars who are wrongfully imprisoned. Uh, the, there are um, no convictions. Uh, all accusations are fabricated. Um, there are illegal searches, arbitra arbitrary uh, arrests, detentions that were mentioned. And um, this Crimean Solidarity Group is making them uh, making uh, themselves heard uh, through this activism. And uh, in particular, members of the Ukrainian Cultural Center are now actively participating in the Crimean uh, Solidarity activities. And uh, uh, they take part in, um, uh, I guess, in, in many of these um, um, trial sessions that take place in defense of the uh, Crimean Tatars. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's, there are no crimes mm. committed and there are no right. evidence, but one thing that stands out uh, is that it is impossible to conduct a fair trial as Russia is in violation of the Geneva Convention. Uh, and by applying its legislation in occupied territory. So right. um, uh, we are out there very active and that is the reason why we sour the image of Russia that the annexation was unanimous and it was not. And we did not participate at the referendum, by the way. Absolutely, thank you very much. And so Mr. Umarov, um, we, uh, by the way, everyone, thank you all for joining in on this discussion. We have 15 minutes to go for our uh, two participants. I would like for us to keep our question, our answers as succinct as possible so that we can kind of utilize this 15 minutes efficiently. But Mr. Umarov, um, our next question, it seemed like they're from a nominist that's in 10D, two questions in one. What additional sanctions will be imposed on Russian companies for working in Crimea? Um, we as uh, you, you're asking as Ukraine uh, or that's actually you know what that's a good that that's a um, actually you know what uh, thank you for uh, for as much sanctions we could yeah. put in, uh, for the Russian companies that would be uh, much productive for uh, for the whole world. The reason <clears> is uh, when they use this money to occupy the foreign territory, uh, abduct people, uh, violate human rights, uh, violate the religious beliefs as they do in uh, Crimea. Uh, that is a matter of fact of international security uh, reasons. So that is why, yes, we uh, appeal uh, in our parliament some of the laws uh, on uh, limitation on work of the Russian companies and sanction them. And additionally, we appeal to the international community so that they continue pressurizing uh, Russian Federation on uh, sanctions, uh, industrial sanctions, sanctions uh, for the companies, for the personalities, it's for sure. Okay, thank you very much.
So, by the way, forgive me if I sound a little bit hesitant because there's some um, feedback for some reason, but it's um, okay now. Uh, the next question I have for you, Mr. Umarov, is uh, dealing with COVID-19 and asking how is this pandemic impacting the Crimean Tatar com uh, community specifically? I know it's impacting everybody in Ukraine across the board, but particularly for IVPs, what, what type of impacts are you uh, finding um, that's particularly specific to this uh, community? Uh, as you know, uh, we are advocating uh, Crimea and Ukraine in the international arena and the, the visiting of the international organizations and visiting, uh, visiting our uh, partners is uh, or international platforms was a major uh, helping hand for those who are seeking support. Unfortunately, we cannot travel now. So that is why we use uh, all the uh, possibilities on online Zooming to advocate the human rights violations, religious beliefs, persecutions, uh, and to inform uh, uh, society or international partners about it. Of course, uh, it affected us uh, severely in uh, revenue generation issues for our small and medium enterprises, uh, for those people who support those uh, advocacy groups. Uh, in addition, uh, we, of course, like trying to help people on the ground in Ukraine and uh, in mainland Ukraine and occupied territory of uh, Crimea. Uh, for the human rights advocacy and the uh, uh, religious advocacies. Uh, and this COVID actually hit it, as I said, small and medium enterprises and advocacy groups as well. Uh, so it's for short uh, answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, how much of the local elections, which are, are soon to take, soon, soon to begin, focusing on Crimea, Mr. Umarov? Unfortunately, uh, our temporarily occupied territories of Donbass and Crimea cannot participate. Right. Uh, but thanks God, we have a lot of IDPs who are now taking part uh, in their uh, newly regions. Uh, so basically, IDPs are now located in many uh, cities. We uh, have uh, up to several million people that uh, fled the occupied territories because of Russian aggression, and they take. Uh, their voice is important in local elections. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have uh, many activists that are running for the local uh, uh, regional, uh, let's say, uh, councils. And uh, namely from the Crimean Tatar community, uh, I think there are up to 15 uh, persons registered to run in different parts of Ukraine. So how does it affect us? It doesn't affect uh, uh, much, uh, but uh, it gives a signal towards the next election. So mm -hmm. in the short period of time, we are actually going to have a local election, but it signals uh, for the next, let's say, parliamentary elections or presidential elections within the Crimean Tatar uh, community. Of course, we are discussing a potential elections or a potential rotation in the Majlis uh, or uh, making a conference within the Kurultai delegates. And uh, we will be having a kind of discussion on potential elections in the World Congress of Crimean Tatars. So that's thank you. Now. Okay, thank you very much. So we have nine minutes left. And so I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Uh, Bakala, and uh, please, just in a very, you know, as, as succinctly as possible, this question is from Valentin uh, Stutz, and forgive me if I did not pronounce your last name properly. The question is, do Crimean Tatars have support from other minority groups that faced persecution in the Soviet period, such as Chechens and uh, English? Um. I think uh, the uh, Crimean Tatars um, are um, uh, the 
positions on the human rights and um, democratic values, uh, espousing democratic values, is attractive uh, to many other groups who are also similarly uh, oppressed, repressed, and um, are not able to live uh, freely in their own uh, homeland. Um, but um, the, as I mentioned, that. Um, at the UN Permanent Forum on in Indigenous Issues, uh, there are uh, many diverse Indigenous peoples from different regions, uh, uh, Latin America, as well as uh, um, you know different parts of uh, of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, former Soviet Union states, and uh, also uh, Indigenous people in the Americas as well. Uh, we have a common denominator in pursuing our rights as indigenous people. Uh, but um, with respect to uh, specific on and one, one of the, um, uh, when we place our issues before the permanent forum, uh, Terrell, um, and when we seek out resolutions or solutions to our situation, um, uh, some of the comments that are made by the permanent forum is that indigenous people work closely with their nation states in order to um, uh, address their um, issues, their concerns. And uh, Crimean Tatars have been quite effective and Ukraine has also been very embracing. As you can see at your platform, we have two Crimean Tatars who are representatives within the Ukrainian government. So we are uh, uh, working very, very closely because of, with the uh, Ukrainian nation because they are providing us uh, platforms, they are providing support, and as well as uh, Crimea SOS, which is very, very active in uh, the work of, uh, in helping Crimean Tatars uh, with their displacement as well. And if I can just briefly uh, share with you, uh, that the uh, representative of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea, Mr. Anton Kronovich and Crimea SOS are, uh, have a education initiative for the Crimean Tatars in occupied Crimea, in which um, they are providing through uh, legal administrative ways to get educated in mainland Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this is so crucial because it is one of those soft powers to pre preempt Crimea from being a frozen conflict. And uh, so I think that was a brilliant move on part of uh, ARC and uh, Crimea SOS in uh, making that happen in a, in a nutshell. Thank you. So we, we have five minutes and I wish I could ask you all the questions I want to ask you, but that's impossible. So I have to do the very difficult work of, of choosing since I'm the moderator. Um, <laughs> so I... <laughs> So here it goes. So Mr. Mr. Umarov, how has the occupation of Crimea impacted you personally? Well, I was uh, the delegate, I am a delegate of Crimean Tatar uh, Kurulta and I was a chief of staff of uh, Mr. Mustafa Jamilov, who is a, a leader of Crimean Tatars. Mm -hmm. um, I've been to all the negotiations from 2014 until today. Uh, or, and if today there is no uh, blood spilled in Crimea, it's because of the Crimean Tatar leadership who's been asked by Ukrainian uh, authorities, by the European authorities, Turkish authorities, US authorities, uh, not to start a war uh, because it would have been affecting uh, Donbas or mainland uh, Ukraine. Unfortunately, uh, we left in occupation and all of uh, our assets ceased. I could not uh, travel to uh, Crimea uh, and during the visits on the 
uh, territories that Russians has the influence uh, always uh, might be stopped, uh, abducted, or being uh, transferred to Russia. In addition to it, uh, of course, the Russian media uh, is making up uh, the stereotype of us being uh, the extremists, trying to uh, put uh, our names, uh, blame uh, us personally, uh, my family and others in things that we've never done or not known. Uh, so uh, it's a, a small just reflection on your questions, what's being done by Russian authorities and uh, authorities that are temporarily uh, are in occupied territory, uh, saying about us personally. Uh, Ms. Bakala, uh, one minute, please, because um, we have a couple minutes left. So one minute, please. How has all this impacted you personally? Well, um, just um, I think it provided an opportunity uh, as an active Crimean Tatar and following the legacy of my father, who was born in Keslev, Crimea, and who has just a legacy to never leave the Crimean Tatar community. And with that a responsibility and obligation, I have been involved uh, in uh, prior to uh, 2014, since 2009, I'm the first uh, executive member of the World Congress of Crimean Tatars and who have actively uh, been working uh, to um, give a platform and a voice to the uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, not only in, uh, at the UN, but also in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bakala. And I want to wrap everything up. Uh, definitely appreciate everybody, uh, all of our viewers coming in to join us. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Bakala, U.S. Representative and Executive Member of the World uh, Congress of Crimean Tartars and Representative to, of the UN, of Crimean Tartars at the United Nations and also to uh, First Deputy Foreign Minister uh, Jap Japarova and also to Mr. Uh, Rustem uh, Umarov, who's a member of parliament. Thank you all very much for giving us your precious time and talking about this very pressing issue. Thank you very much, Terrell. It was an honor to be with you and the Atlantic Council. Absolutely. Let me see here.